This is Hannah Friedthal of the Department of French Literature, Thought, and Culture. I did not initially jump at the opportunity to speak on the topic of thinking in pandemic times, not because I wasn't intrigued by the idea. I just don't have much time to think these days. For some, social distancing is lonely. For others, including myself, this lockdown makes solitude more precious and rare than ever before. I'm spending my days caring for a young child while also learning to teach online. I'm my family's primary grocery shopper and cook. Writing and thinking these days often feel like luxuries I can't afford, and I say this in full awareness of my privilege as a person who's able to practice social distancing and to work remotely as best I can. This morning, while teaching my son to count by tens, I was at the same time reflecting on the relationship between care work and critical thought. My mind was moving between the reality at hand, 70, 80, 90, 100, and the question, why doesn't French literature represent this? When I attempt to pinpoint a scene of caretaking or housework in the literature I teach and study, the first image that comes to mind is from Mousseman's 1884 decadent novel, Arrebourg. The hero, a sickly esthete, has outfitted his two servants with thick felt slippers so that he'll never have to hear their footsteps. He even has a bonnet and hood made for one of them so that her shadow, as she passes his windows, will be more pleasing to him. This erasure of domestic labor is ironic and over the top, of course, but it's also symptomatic of a broader trend. There is certainly a French tradition of conceptualizing the life of the mind as a laborious enterprise. Flaubert immediately comes to mind. Here's a famous passage from a letter he wrote to Louise Collet in April 1852. J'aime mon travail d'un amour frénétique et perverti, comme un ascète le silice qui lui gratte le ventre. Quelquefois, quand je me trouve vide, quand l'expression se refuse, quand, après avoir griffonné de longues pages, je découvre n'avoir pas fait une phrase, je tombe sur mon divan et j'y reste hébété dans un marais intérieur d'ennui. I love the unromantic perversity of this. Of course, writing can only become an act of mortification and penance if you have cooks and servants to deal with the everyday business of life. One of the realities of quarantine with a young child is that interruptions are constant. Here, French thought consoles me because it is a rich source for the idea of intellectual or artistic practice as nourished by interruption, especially the interruptions of one's own body with its frailties, illnesses, and accidents. This literature is marked by instances of thought suddenly diverted, reoriented, and recharged by an unexpected occurrence. One thinks of Montaigne, thrown from his horse in De l'Exercitation, or of Rousseau, knocked over by a dog in Les Rêveries d'un Promeneur Solitaire, and delightfully reborn to his own légère existence. In Proust, à la recherche du temps perdu, the hero is frequently stopped in his tracks by the world, astonished by some delicate sensory apparition, a hedge in bloom, a flash of light on a pond, the iridescent shimmer on a plate of asparagus, or the taste of a madeleine dipped in tea. Such apparitional events, visionary moments in a philosopher or writer's life, highlight the thinker's vulnerability and beholdenness to chance, and draw our attention to the unruliness of the body, which can never be cordoned off from the life of the mind. I have to wonder, though, how Rousseau's reflections would be different if the thinker's state of calme ravissant were interrupted by a child asking, what comes after 100? Where's that rêverie? Where's the book in which the Proustian narrator gets his own cup of tea, rather than having it brought to him by a servant, on the orders of his mother, who immediately and conveniently disappears so that he can savor his epiphany alone. I'd like to be the heroic subject who seeks enlightenment in my tilleul, but in reality I'm also the servant who buys, brews, and carries in the tea, and the mother who anticipates her son's every desire. The point I'm coming to here is that to think in pandemic times, for me at least, is to hone a skill that many of us were already practicing with more or less success in pre-pandemic life. More than ever now, we have to be able to leap at a moment's notice between different registers of thought. We have to zigzag between abstraction and practicality. This requires a great deal of emotional and intellectual flexibility. This is a moment in which it behooves us to reflect on the conditions of possibility for thought and about the way these conditions, this often invisibilized housework, care work, emotion work, shows up or doesn't in art. Contemporary philosopher Jacques Rancière 
has written at length about the relationship between art, democracy, and work. He puts it in terms of the partage du sensible, the distribution of the sensible, that determines, for example, who gets to enjoy art or have their exploits represented in it, and who's busy behind the scenes, consigned to the realm of mere life. Rancière is especially attuned to breaches in the system, moments of impropriety, when bodies get shifted from their assigned places and a new order of things becomes imaginable. Thus, in his book La Nuit des Proletaires, Rancière examines a group of 19th century worker poets who refused to know their place. They spent their days working and their nights thinking and writing, thus disrupting expected divisions and hierarchies of time and perception. But what about the caregiver or parent who wants to think? There are some French-language artworks that invite us to imagine the world from the perspective of the domestic labor, laborer or care worker. One thinks, for example, of Flaubert's 1877 story, Un Coeur Simple, or of Ousmane Sambin's 1966 film, La Noire Deux. Both of these works take seriously the domestic worker's deprivations and exclusions, but also explore her longings, her aesthetic sensibility. Other types of work are more frequently represented in French literature. Naturalist Émile Zola is famous for his heroic depiction of striking coal miners in Germinal. Even more interesting for my purposes is his 1883 novel, Au Bonheur des Dames, which makes visible the emotion work of the service sector worker, the shop girl forced to keep smiling despite the pain in her feet. By contrast, motherhood is intensely idealized in Zola and never imagined as a form of work. In Simone Weil's La Condition Ouvrière, composed in the mid-1930s, we're asked to reflect on the monotony and humiliations of unskilled factory labor, but also on the possibility that philosophy could be a form of solidarity and an experiential practice rather than a work of abstraction. Like Rancière's worker poets 100 years earlier, Weil refuses to respect the rule that says some bodies are destined for intellectual work, others for manual labor. Still, all those hours spent toiling in a noisy factory do not leave one much time or energy to write. As Ve puts it in a letter to a student, Il y a longtemps que je veux vous écrire, mais le travail d'usine n'incite guère à la correspondance. The most striking examples of domestic and intellectual work as imbricated in one another come from outside the French tradition. There's a remarkable chapter in Virginia Woolf's 1927 novel, to the lighthouse, in which Mrs. Ramsay is reading a story to her six-year-old son, and at the same time reflecting on life, and how it is, quote, terrible, hostile, and quick to pounce on you if you give it a chance, end quote. Wolf explores Mrs. Ramsay's mind as she is reading aloud, and simultaneously pursuing her own thoughts, quote, the story was like the bass, gently accompanying a tune, which now and then ran up unexpectedly into the melody, End quote. I've never seen this phenomenon represented elsewhere, but it speaks deeply to my own experience, and perhaps to yours as well. Poet Emily Dickinson didn't have children, but she was intimately acquainted with this daily counterpoint, this enmeshment in, of mere life with the life of the mind. She was the baker of her family, and wrote many verses on kitchen papers and other household scraps, recipes, ripped paper bags, invitations, chocolate wrappers, prescription blanks, magazine clippings, shopping lists, and so on. One of my favorites is a couplet that she scratched out in pencil on the torn-off, wing-like seal of an envelope. In this short life that merely lasts an hour, how much, how little, is within our power. What I love about Dickinson is the tension between the smallness and hominess of her meter, she always wrote in hymn meter, also called common meter, and the wild, visionary quality of her verse. In her poems composed on household scraps, she accommodates her poetry to the peculiar shape of the material at hand. We thus see her engaged in a practice that we all know well now, the art of making do. Thinking in pandemic times is thinking with and in the everyday. What if poetry and philosophy were simply other modes of domestic work, not unlike baking bread or knitting a sock? Pandemic times are times of scarcity, of working with what you've got, in all senses. I'm running low on baker's yeast, and I'm separated from most of my books. 
It's clearer now than ever that writing has nothing to do with divine or otherworldly inspiration. Rather, it's a daily practice of making, remaking, and mending. The French author who best represents this ethos is poet Francis Ponge. Starting in the 1930s, Ponge made the everyday into the subject of his poetry. He composed poems about the most ordinary things. A glass of water, an orange, a potato, a bar of soap, a packing crate, a snail. When Ponge writes about a more familiar poetic topic, like flowers, he de-idealizes it, presenting flowers not as manifestations of romantic freedom or classical symmetry, but merely as, quote, badly washed cups worked on by maintenance men butterflies with shrunken rag bodies. But Ponge didn't just write about the everyday. He made the act of writing poetry ordinary too, insisting on the everydayness of poetic making by exposing his own labor. In the notebook poems, in his notebook poems, Ponge lets us see all the drafts, the research, the dead ends, the inconclusive jottings and observations, all that stuff of writing that is normally crossed out and abandoned. Ponge lays bare the scaffolding of his poetry and works like La Mounine, une note après coup sur un ciel de Provence, written in 1941 at another moment of crisis. This poem, if we can even call it that, consists of nothing more than a series of incomplete attempts to describe a landscape seen from a bus window early one April morning. I'm moved by this poem's remarkable inarticulacy, its sheer imperfection. Here, for example, Ponge is trying to describe the sky. Rien ne ressemble plus à la nuit. C'est trop dire. Disons seulement, il a quelque chose de la nuit. Il évoque la nuit. Il n'est pas si, si différent de la nuit. Il a une valeur de nuit. Il a les valeurs de la nuit. Il a la même valeur, les mêmes valeurs que la nuit. Il vaut la nuit. Ce jour vaut la nuit. Ce jour descendre là. As the poem labors to convey a radiant thisness that remains unspecifiable, likeness is only rendered in a ragged, imprecise language of near equivalence, of not quite resemblance, as each successive proposition wears away at and destabilizes the precedent, and verbs of comparison pile up. I'm struck by the radical awkwardness of this poetry. I love that Ponge doesn't try to hide his effort, that he doesn't try to cover over the rough edges of this poem. He certainly doesn't make writing look easy. Like housework, Ponge's poetry is never done. It's, resol it's resolutely non-virtuosic. It's barely beautiful. It's anything but dazzling. It's an art of making do, an ever-unfinished work of repair. Thanks for listening. Stay well.